The Christmas season is one of tradition. As the winter solstice approaches, families all around the world conduct their own unique rituals. Some of them dress up nice and go to a fancy restaurant, others like to watch terrible movies at the theater, and the lucky ones leave the desolate winter landscape that folks like myself are trapped in to close out the year in a beautiful climate, getting sunburnt on a beach and drinking their way into a diabetic coma. For many families, it's a Christmas tradition to watch the Nutcracker Ballet, either on film or on stage, but only a small percentage of those families have actually read the book the ballet was based on, and that is what we're diving into today. You see, the ballet premiered in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1892, with music composed by Pyotr Tchaikovsky, the same man who scored the Swan Lake Ballet that we discussed the origins of last Christmas. And similar to Swan Lake, the Nutcracker was met with abysmal, dare I say, hateful reviews. The critics despised this thing. Although they had mostly nice words for Tchaikovsky's score, the choreography of the dancers was called clumsy and confusing, they resented the decision to feature children in the lead roles, and some even claimed that it shouldn't be considered a ballet at all, but rather a spectacle that was insulting to perform on the first-class stage. Another point of criticism was that it wasn't loyal to the original story written by German author E.T.A. Hoffmann. Instead, they adapted the French translation by Alexander Dumas, who made it more sweet and sentimental. But even then, they didn't follow the events of Dumas' plot very closely either. They mostly just incorporated its light-hearted vibe, which was not present at all in Hoffman's tale. Hoffman told the Nutcracker story in a dark, disturbing way that perfectly captured the terror its main character felt when the seven-headed mouse king threatened her life and the life of her beloved Nutcracker. That's why in this episode, I'm going to share with you the original story in all of its glory so you can see exactly how it inspired the ballet which in turn inspired many adaptations of its own. Also, the origins of Nutcrackers, because you deserve to know how such a hideous creation came to be. First, though, I do want to let you all know this episode is brought to you by me. And those of you who've supported the channel by liking, subscribing, and purchasing one of our limited time crop of sweatshirts that just dropped at meremortals.store. If you're like me and have always wanted a way to honor the Yuletide traditions of our ancestors and look good while doing it, then look no further. The link to our store is in the description and pinned comment below. Just make sure you act fast because they won't be available after New Year's Day. Also, I just want to clarify, since we're talking about a German story, that my sweatshirt has a typo on it. It should say Gruß vom Krampus but I'm an uncultured swine and I spelt it wrong in my instructions to the artist. Don't worry though, the design was fixed before any orders besides mine were placed, so your German fluent friends won't be able to roast ya. Anyway, let's dive into the messed up origins of the Nutcracker. All right, so the setup for the ballet and the original Hoffmann story are very similar. They're both set on Christmas Eve in Germany, where a family is putting together their finishing touches on the Christmas tree. In the ballet and in Dumas' story, the family's last name is Silberhaus, which translates to Silverhouse. But in Hoffmann's original work, they're the Stahlbombs, which means steel tree. Another interesting change is that in the ballet, the main character is a seven-year-old girl named Clara, while in both Dumas and Hoffmann's work, she's named Marie, and Clara is her doll's name. So just to reiterate, in Hoffmann's story, she's named Marie Stahlbaum, in Dumas' translation, she's Marie Silberhaus, and in the ballet, she's Clara Silberhaus. I couldn't find anything on why her name was changed for the ballet, but I thought it was fitting that she goes by Clara in Barbie and the Nutcracker, since Barbie is actually a doll, just like the original Clara. Now in the story, Marie and her brother Fritz are patiently waiting for the the reveal of the family Christmas tree, which lies on the other side of the closed parlor doors, and they're taking guesses at what magnificent gifts their godfather Drosselmeyer is going to bring them. Drosselmeyer is described as not a very handsome man. He was small and thin, had many wrinkles in his face, over his right eye he had a large black patch, and he was without hair, for which reason he wore a very nice white wig. This was made of glass, however, and was a very ingenious piece of work. As you may conclude from his unique choice of headgear, Drosselmeyer is an inventor, and every year he brings the children one-of-a-kind gifts that he makes himself. When the parlor doors open, the children are nearly blinded by the bright lights of their Christmas tree, but after the 
their eyes properly dilate, they ask Drosselmeyer for their gifts, and he happily obliges. This year, he presents them with a clockwork castle featuring mechanical people moving around it. A king, a queen, and some knights in shining armor all have their own routines that repeat on a loop. And while the children find this really cool at first, they get bored of it pretty quickly because it's a fragile art piece that can't actually be played with. Personally, I think it's totally fair they got bored with it eventually, but Drosselmeyer may have been a little too emotionally invested in the project because he takes their boredom very personally and says, an ingenious work like this was not made for stupid children. Like, damn, bro. Maybe you're the stupid one for gifting little kids a sculpture to stare at especially back then when the bar for toys was so low. Kids spent hours playing with a rubber glove and an apple. You couldn't give them something they could at least touch? Well, in the ballet, Drosselmeyer's gift is similar, but different. He gives them life-sized mechanical dolls that can dance, but as impressive as those are, they only hold their attention for so long. In both versions, after those stupid children lose interest in their gift, something else catches Marie's eye, an ugly little doll called the Nutcracker. And that's not just me trying to be mean, by the way. The Nutcracker's hideous appearance is important to the story, similar to the frog in The Princess and the Frog or Beast in Beauty and the Beast. It had a broad, stout body that was out of proportion with its slim little legs and his head was even bigger. He wore a military outfit that included a violet jacket, tight violet pantaloons, polished pristine boots, and a woodman's cap on his head. He did have some nice features though, like clear green eyes that emanated kindness and benevolence, a nicely trimmed beard of white cotton, and a sweet smile. I think now's a good time to address the rather unique appearance of Nutcrackers, because keep in mind, the way he's described in this story written over 200 years ago is a near perfect description of Nutcrackers made today. So how is it that this became their default design and why hasn't it changed? Well, originally Nutcrackers were simple tools made out of wood or metal, but there was a particular region in Germany known as the Ore Mountains that played a major role in their evolution to little figurines. Apparently, during during the harsh winter months, the miners and manufacturers living in the Ore Mountains couldn't work, and so many resorted to logging and wood carving to make ends meet. One of the clever contraptions they would carve were little figurines that would crack nuts with their teeth and they were designed to look like miners, policemen, and even kings. It's believed that their iconic soldier design came as a result of the many military conquests that were attempted on the Ore Mountains. Empires neighboring Germany naturally wanted control over such a large area rich in minerals, but the rough terrain and harsh mountain conditions often caused these invasions to fail. The Ore Mountain residents, who were accustomed to the miserable conditions and the takeover attempts, allegedly mocked the invading forces forces by designing the goofy nutcracking figurines to resemble them. Kind of like how you can buy toilet paper with Joe Biden and Trump's faces on it. Similar concept, but the Nutcrackers are arguably more tasteful. What also made Nutcrackers unique was that they were both practical and beautifully designed, so they made great gifts that were often put on display when they weren't in use unlike the aforementioned toilet paper. Nutcrackers originating as gifts during the winter months was likely responsible for people associating them with Christmas in the early days, but I also think that Hoffman's story, Dumas' adaptation, and the ballet played key roles in immortalizing their soldier design and forever making them a symbol of the Christmas season. That being said, nowadays you can find Nutcrackers in a variety of forms, like tropical tourists, construction workers, and yes, even Baby Yoda. What has the world come to? Well, all of the Stahlbaum children are intrigued by Drosselmeyer's Nutcracker, and their father shows them how it works. Then, Marie, Fritz, and their sister Louise pass him among themselves, cracking nuts, until of course her brother Fritz pushes it too far and tries cracking one that's so big and hard that his jaw breaks. I gave your mother a similar experience. Naturally, Marie is upset that their new toy is broken, but her siblings don't really care, so she uses a ribbon from her dress as a makeshift bandage for him until Drosselmeyer can fix him. Then, her parents put him in the special glass display case where all of their gifts from Drosselmeyer eventually end up, and the family goes to bed. But here's where the story starts to get really interesting. Marie gets permission from her mom to stay up just a little past her bedtime so she can tend to the injured nutcracker and her mom allows it because Marie has always been a responsible girl who she can trust to keep her promise and go to bed. But when the clock struck midnight, everything changed. 
Marie saw the owl on top of the grandfather clock, using its wings to cover the face and muffle the sound. Suddenly, the floor began to shake, and when she looked down, she saw thousands of glowing eyes glimmering through cracks in the floorboards. A moment later, the floor erupts with an outpour of little mice, and as they line up like a military infantry, the evil seven-headed mouse king makes his grand entrance, rocking seven golden crowns on his head. The shock of the scene that exploded before her sent Marie into a dizzy spell that caused her to fall into the glass display case and slice open her little arm. But I guess her adrenaline was pumping because the pain doesn't bother her much. Just as the mice are finished getting into battle formation, the other fighting force begins to assemble. The Nutcracker leaps out of the cabinet and is caught by Marie's doll, Miss Clara, her namesake in the ballet. Then Fritz's toy soldiers form ranks and start shooting at the mouse army. But I'm sure you're wondering, what kind of ammo would the toys be shooting? Well, I can tell you, the toy soldiers, the good guys, are firing sugar plums at the mice and covering them in white powder. Probably not a very effective tactic, but it's cute. The mice, on the other hand, he describes their artillery as odious offensive balls that made dreadful spots on their red jackets. So I'm pretty sure they were hurling mouse poo. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something. You lit professors can comment your interpretations below, but that's the first thing that came to my mind when considering what kind of odious offensive balls mice have access to. Well, as you can imagine, when you're willing to go so far to attain victory that you're harvesting your own feces and turning it into weapons, you get the victory. And it's not even close. Before long, the Nutcracker soldiers have all been taken out or ran for their lives, leaving him vulnerable to the seven-headed Mouse King. Now, do you remember that scene in Star Wars where Lou, Khan, and Chewie have just saved Leia, but now they don't know how to escape, so she's gotta take control of the situation and save their skins? Well, that's basically what happens here. Marie has just witnessed the cowardice and frustrating ineffectualness of the Doll Army, then sees the Nutcracker about to fall into the clutches of the Mouse King, so she springs into action. She grabs her slipper and chucks it as hard as she can at the Mouse King and knocks him on his dirty little butt. The surprise attack scrambles his army and they all retreat back into the floorboards, but the day isn't safe just yet. As the scene quieted and Marie's adrenaline left her, her arm began to burn and bleed, and a few moments later, she passed out. Now, fans of the ballet are probably surprised right now because the book's battle ends on a far less hopeful note than the ballet's. To be clear, there's probably a dozen different versions of the ballet, if not more, but the one I'm referring to is the most mainstream one that all the others have descended from. Was that enough hand gestures for you? Because in the ballet, Clara is shrunken down to the size of a toy before the Mouse Army does battle with the Nutcracker and his homies. And in that version, it's the battle to end all battles. After the Nutcracker's army is defeated, he duels the Mouse King 1v1 on Rust, and he's about to lose. But at the last minute, Clara saves him by throwing her slipper, which I don't think would be nearly as effective as the full-size slipper she threw in the story, but regardless, it's enough to distract the Mouse King from making the killing blow. Then, the Nutcracker takes advantage of his distracted opponent and slays him. So when it comes to the ballet, the Nutcracker's feud with the Mouse King ends right then and there, but in the book, it's just getting started, and we're about to uncover the full story of their feud. When Marie wakes up the following morning, she's in her bed with a bandage around her arm, and her pissed off mother tells her that she found her in a pool of her blood with shattered glass all around her and many of the toys destroyed. Marie tries to explain how it all happened and how she witnessed the battle between the toys and the mice, but her mother wasn't buying it. And for the next week, Marie is forced to spend all of her time in bed recovering from her injury. A few days into her recovery, Drosselmeyer pays her a visit Visit and presents her with a nice surprise. He's fixed the Nutcracker's broken jaw. Then he sits down with Marie and her siblings and begins telling them the story of Princess Pearlypat. Now, just so we're all on the same page, we are entering a story within a story. However, this second story is really the backstory of the first story. Capish? To make this long story short, Princess Pearlypat's family had a feud with the Mouse Queen, the Mouse King's mother who we'll refer to as Madame Mouse Ranks. The Madame Mouse Ranks made an enemy out of the king when she and her relatives stole all the fat for the sausages he planned on serving at a banquet. 
and to get revenge, he killed her entire family. A bit of an overreaction, but remember, the king sees the mouse rink royal family as just mice, so he was basically like, we have a rodent infestation, take care of it. And his traps killed every single one but the madam herself who in turn swore to take revenge on the king's daughter. After Princess Pearly Pat was born, her mother installed a one-of-a-kind pest control system. She surrounded the princess's crib with women whose only job was to continuously stroke cats that were sitting in their lap so they would stay awake and stay on the lookout for the mice. Sounds like a surefire strategy, right? Well, one day the nurses all fell asleep and so did their cats and this gave Madame Mouse Rinks the perfect opportunity to sneak into the princess's crib and transform her into a nutcracker. But how great was their terror when they looked at Pearly Pat and saw what a change had taken place in the sweet, beautiful child. Instead of the white and red face with golden locks, a large, ill-shaped head sat upon her thin, shriveled body. Her azure blue eyes were changed into green staring ones, and her little mouth had stretched itself from ear to ear. Now, if you thought the king was mad about his sausage getting ruined, just imagine his rage when he found out his daughter was turned into a hideous wooden doll. But instead of taking any responsibility for starting this feud with Madame Mouse Ranks, he blamed the inventor who made the traps that failed to kill her, and ordered him to find a cure within four weeks or be executed. That inventor's name is Drosselmeyer, the very same man who brought the Nutcracker to the stall bombs and is telling them this story within a story. Drosselmeyer consulted with his astrologer buddy who read Pearly Pat's horoscope and learned there was indeed a cure, but it was complicated. To transform the princess into her old self, they had to find a special nut known as the Krakatuk and give it to a young man who had never been shaved nor worn boots since birth. Then, after he cracks it between his teeth, he must close his eyes, give her the kernel, and take seven steps backward without stumbling. Basically, he had to pass a field sobriety test. Well, Drosselmeyer reports this discovery to the king, who's now even more furious at the elaborate hoops they have to jump through, and banishes Drosselmeyer from the kingdom, saying he shan't come back back until he finds the Krakatuk and the Chosen One. Drosselmeyer then spends the next 15 years looking all over the country with no luck, and at this point he's more homesick than his poor heart can bear. So he decides to return to Nuremberg to visit his brother because for all he knows, the Krakatuk and the Chosen One have been there this whole time. And it turns out he's right. Not only did Drosselmeyer's brother, a puppet maker, have the Krakatuk in his possession after buying it off a nut merchant, his young son, Drosselmeyer's nephew, fit the exact criteria they needed. He was a young man who never shaved nor worn boots since he was born. See, back in those days, kids weren't given their first nice pair of boots until they'd gotten older, because they'd just outgrow them. The young nephew is brought before the king, the queen, and the princess, and before their very eyes, he cracks the Krakatuk and gives it to the princess instantly restoring her to her beautiful form. She was no longer a baby like when she was first cursed, but now a beautiful young woman, and she was eager to marry the man who saved her. At first, things took a sudden turn for the worse when the nephew took his seven steps backward, for on his final step, Madame Mouse Rinks climbed out of the floor, causing him to step on her and trip. This meant that whatever magic was in the air backfired, so instead of the curse being lifted, it fell onto him turning him into a nutcracker. And the moment this happened, oh, you better believe that Princess Pearly Pat lost all interest in shacking up with her savior. The king was also immediately turned off, and instead of thanking Drosselmeyer for saving his daughter, he banished him for trying to give him a nutcracker as a son-in-law. So it's safe to say that Drosselmeyer and friends botched that mission hardcore. It took them 15 years to find the MacGuffin, they turned an innocent young man into a puppet, and were perfect permanently exiled from their homeland. The only positive outcome was that Madame Mouse Rinks was killed when the now Nutcracker stepped on her, but even then, he just made a new lifelong enemy out of her son. The exiles didn't have many options for what to do next, so the astronomer checked the boy's horoscope again, and it predicted that he could be cured of the curse and become a prince when he slays the Mouse King and when a girl loves him despite his ugly shape. At this point, the story within a story ends and we return to the main story. 
The Stahlbaum children have all been really invested in the tale, but only Marie truly understands the significance of it. She knows that her Drosselmeyer is the one from the story, and the nutcracker he gave them is really his nephew. She's also determined to help him fulfill his destiny. That night, a sleeping Marie was startled awake by the Mouse King whispering into her ear. She tries to scream, but she can't make a sound. She tries to move, but her hands and feet are paralyzed, and she is forced to listen as the Mouse King threatens to devour the Nutcracker unless she gives him her sweets and her dolls. Wanting to spare her beloved Nutcracker, she fulfills his request, but this just makes him want more. And after a few nights of devouring all that remains of her Christmas candy, Marie starts to fear that she's next on his menu. Since no one in her family believes her stories about the Mouse King and Drosselmeyer plays dumb every time she brings it up, her only outlet for support is the Nutcracker. She opens up his display case, picks him up, and confesses all of her worries to him. Then she wipes a little blood off his neck, an injury from the battle a few days prior and her warm, loving hands seem to give the Nutcracker life. He only has enough energy for one sentence, though. He asks her to get him a sword so he can slay the Mouse King. Then, he returns to his frozen, lifeless state. It didn't take long for Marie to find him a weapon. It just so happened that Fritz had recently retired one of his toy soldiers, so he wouldn't be needing his sword anymore. She brought the Nutcracker his weapon, left the display case slightly ajar so he could escape, and that night, she laid awake in bed, patiently waiting for his return. Around midnight, she heard a strange rustling and rattling and scraping across the floor. But just when she began to fear the worst, a familiar voice cried out. She threw open her bedroom door, and there stood the Nutcracker, donning the Mouse King's seven bloody crowns around his arm. He thanks Marie for giving him the courage and the tools to defeat the evil Mouse King, and vows to be in her service until his death. Then he takes her to Narnia. And I'm not even joking. He leads Marie through a magic passageway in the wardrobe, and they end up in the Doll Kingdom, which appears to be made entirely of candy and populated by dolls and sweet treats alike. This is the point where the ballet's plot and the story's plot sort of come back together, because after the ballet's Mouse King is killed in Act 1, the Nutcracker and the Princess spend the majority of Act 2 in the Land of the Sweets, where they watch the Sugar Plum Fairies dance. So they essentially skipped over the Nutcracker's backstory to get to the very end. There's also a small detail from the story that, funnily enough, mirrors the eventual real-life reception to the ballet. Because at one point, Marie and the Nutcracker watch some shepherds and shepherdesses dance a very pretty ballet, but the Nutcracker describes it as miserably performed, kind of like those critics who saw the ballet at the premiere. After Marie's tour of the Doll Kingdom concludes, they wind up at the capital in the Nutcracker's palace, and it's here that she actually falls asleep. When she wakes up the next morning, she's back in her bed. Her doll friends had apparently carried her home safe and sound, but when she excitedly tries to share her adventures in the kingdom with her family, they all told her to shut up and stop talking about it. In fact, the doctor who'd been treating Marie told her that if she repeated those ridiculous claims one more time, he'd take her nutcracker and all of her dolls and throw them out the window. A little harsh, don't you think? Regardless of what these adults believe, Marie knows in her heart what happened, so she pays the Nutcracker a visit in his glass display case and gives him a message. She swears that if he were to ever become real, she would never behave as the selfish princess did, and she would love him no matter what he looked like. At this moment, there was a loud bang that caused Marie to faint and fall to the floor, but she soon woke up after to some exciting news. Her mother helped her to her feet and informed her that Drosselmeyer's nephew had just arrived from Nuremberg, and when he entered the room, Marie laid eyes on the handsomest young lad she'd ever seen. The family proceeded to eat their dinner together, then Drosselmeyer's nephew asked Marie if she wanted to go to the sitting room to play which his uncle encouraged. But the moment they were alone, the boy's tone changed. He brought Marie to the glass display case that used to hold the Nutcracker, turned toward her, and got down on one knee. He thanked her for vowing to love him despite his hideous form, and said that her true love broke the curse. Then, he asks her to marry him, and she accepts. A year and a day later, he whisks her away to the Doll Kingdom, where she's crowned queen, and the two live happily ever after. Now, before you say anything, 
I'm a little concerned as well. I mean, at the start of the story, Marie is described as seven years old, so if by the time she marries Drosselmeyer's nephew, she would be eight at the oldest. Gross. Now, I know the nephew was trapped in his nutcracker form for a long time, but if the rules of Princess Pearlypat's transformation apply to him, he would have aged throughout the curse like she did making his marriage to Marie even more disturbing. I guess it's fair to say that I don't fully understand the magic involved, so maybe he didn't age, but if he was old enough to marry the princess before the curse, he's certainly too old to propose to a seven-year-old. I am sure the attitudes about age were different back when this was written in 1816, but even for back then, that seems like a wide gap, and knowing what we know now, it's weird. The ballet definitely took the smart approach in making both Marie and the Nutcracker slash Prince very obviously children and not having them marry each other, so their happily ever after can remain wholesome. I will say though, if you disregard the age gap, then Hoffmann's original ending is much better than the ballet. Professor of German literature, Jack Zipes, said it best. The ballet does a great deal of damage to Hoffmann's story, because at the end of his story, Marie moves off into another world, or it seems that she's going off into another world, a world of her own choosing. Whereas in the ballet, it's a harmless diversion that is full of sort of dancing and merriment, but there's nothing profound in the ending of the ballet as it exists. And it's also true of Dumas' story, which ends in a very fluffy, saccharine way. Not trying to hate on the ballet, of course, but I just don't think it can be denied that Hoffmann's themes of imagination, childhood, and forging your own path have been lost as the story has gone through adaptation after adaptation. The Nutcracker and the Mouse King was an original work with no obvious predecessor. In a way, it's actually the original Toy Story, in a sense that toys come to life and inhabit a secret world of their own. That being said, we can still draw some parallels to classic fairy tales. In the Russian fairy tale, Vasilisa the Beautiful, our heroine gets advice from a magic doll so she can finish the impossible list of chores she's been given by her stepmother and Baba Yaga. That doll didn't have thoughts or feelings though, nor was it a transformed human being or sneaking off to live its own life in a kingdom of candy. It spent all of its time in the protagonist pocket and was only brought out to give advice that she would have to take action on. And on one occasion, it built her a spinning wheel. There is definitely a grain of similarity in there, but the doll serves a far simpler purpose and for that reason could be replaced by almost any inanimate object, like a sword, a comb, or even a rock. No, not the rock, a rock. Although, at this point, the rock is basically an inanimate object as well. There's a Norwegian folktale with a different kind of overlap to the Nutcracker story called The Doll in the Grass, where a young prince is looking for a potential bride and finds a doll in the grass that is so beautiful, he actually wants to marry her. This was the original Lars and the Real Girl. The twist comes in when the prince drops the doll into the water and she transforms into a beautiful princess, kind of like the Nutcracker did but instead of earning the transformation like the Nutcracker, the princesses was random chance. You could also mention some other archetypal elements, like the Beauty and the Beast, which I mentioned earlier, or even the hero's journey. Because the Nutcracker descends into hell, i.e. the mouse hole, to slay the mouse king, which earns him the undying love of Marie and allows him to take his true form as a young man, similar to how Prince Philip slays the dragon, saves Aurora, and becomes king. Or how Pinocchio enters the belly of the whale to save his father and become a real boy. There is no denying that the Nutcracker and the Mouse King is a one-of-a-kind story, but as unique as it is, it was born out of the human imagination and therefore relies on values and themes that are intrinsically human. That is a good thing though, because it's precisely those qualities, along with Hoffmann's wondrous presentation of them, that's allowed the story to stand the test of time and continue to be enjoyed year after year for more than two centuries. But that, mere mortals, will be the last messed up origin that we explore in 2023. Thank you all for tuning into this episode <laughs> and for your support throughout this year. You just can't help yourself, can ya? I'm taking next week off from posting long form content in the hope that I can relax a little bit and regain some of the sanity that I've lost throughout 2023. But rest assured, we've got a packed schedule for 2024 full of topics that you guys have been asking for. 
so remember to tune in on Thursday, January 4th for our return. I'll see you soon, mere mortals. In the meantime, have a great holiday season. My name is John Solo, this is Gunther Bernard, and remember, John shot first.